In the quiet early hours of June 5, 2004, a university town known for its serene campus life was jolted awake by a chilling discovery. On a seemingly peaceful lawn, just a stone's throw away from the University of Missouri, lay a young man. His life abruptly ended in a way so brutal it would unravel a story of secrets, lies, and forbidden relationships. Jesse Valencia, a 23-year-old junior with dreams and aspirations, found face up, his throat slit, leaving behind not just a mystery, but a trail of unanswered questions and hidden truths. Who could commit such a heinous act? What secrets did Jesse hold? And how did a young man's search for love lead to his tragic end? Join us as we dive deep into this gripping tale, piecing together a puzzle that shook a community to its core, because in the search for justice, every detail matters. This isn't just a story. It's a journey through the shadows of a life cut short and a quest to bring closure to a tale that still haunts those left behind. Stay with us as we uncover the truth about Jesse Valencia. Jesse James Wade Valencia, born on February 22, 1981, in Perryville, Missouri, was the son of Lupe Valencia and Linda Boa Valencia. Following his parents' divorce during his childhood, Jesse was primarily raised by his mother. His early years were spent largely in the company of his mother and grandparents on a rural farm in Kentucky. Jesse, who had two sisters, held a special place in his mother's life as her only son. As a teenager, he courageously opened up to his mother about being gay and shared a premonition of an untimely demise, a feeling he couldn't quite explain. His mother's unconditional love and acceptance played a crucial role in his upbringing. Handsome and charismatic, Jesse pursued modeling after high school before moving to Columbia, Missouri to embark on his college education. At the University of Missouri, he was a law and journalism student with aspirations to become a lawyer. Jesse enjoyed the vibrant student nightlife and was known for his love of partying and socializing. He was popular with many friends and sexual partners and was not yet ready to settle down in a monogamous relationship. On the evening of June 4, Jesse was working at a motel. After his shift ended, he attended a campus party where he became quite intoxicated. On June 5, 2004 in the afternoon, several students called 911 after discovering a body on a lawn. Initially, it was thought that the incident could have been a tragic accident. Considering the location of the body between two buildings, it wasn't ruled out that the man might have been intoxicated and attempted to jump from the roof of one building to another. The victim was later identified as Jesse. He was found lying face up, dressed only in shorts. Jesse had been fatally wounded with a deep slash to his throat, so severe that the knife reached his spine, which was confirmed to have been inflicted while he was unconscious. There were no defensive wounds on Jesse's hands, which is typical in knife attacks. He also had several bruises on his upper body. The authorities were unable to locate the murder weapon at the scene. The weapon used to slit his throat had a serrated blade. The medical examiner determined that Jesse had died before 6 a.m. that same day. A review of Jesse's phone records revealed several calls made that evening, including one to his college friend, Ed McDavid, at 3.13 a.m., lasting for 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Detectives interviewed Ed McDavid, who confirmed that he and Jesse had slept together. He mentioned that they last met two nights before Jesse's death. On the night Jesse was murdered, Mokdavit told the detectives that he was at home with his roommate, who corroborated his alibi. Jesse's apartment was located a block away from where his body was found. When detectives arrived at the scene, they found the door to his apartment open, but there were no signs of any disturbance or foul play inside. Under a pile of clothes, detectives discovered a used condom, which was then sent for DNA analysis. The test results revealed the DNA profiles of two individuals, Jesse and Ed McDavid. Further questions arose when DNA tests were conducted on Jesse's fingernails. As found on the condom, the DNA of Jesse and McDavid was present. However, a third, unknown person's DNA profile was also detected. In their investigation, Detectives began interviewing Jesse's friends and urged anyone with information about the night of the murder of the murder to come forward. A young man named Andy Shermerhorn came forward with particularly intriguing information. 
Shermerhorn revealed to the detectives that he and Jesse had a friends with benefits relationship. They had met a few months earlier and had engaged in sexual encounters several times. On one occasion, an unexpected and inappropriate incident occurred. It was late at night and they were in bed together when there was a knock on the door. Jesse got up to answer it and found a police officer in uniform, shining flashlight. Shermerhorn, surprised by the officer's presence, sat up in bed and wrapped himself in a sheet. The officer instructed Jesse and Shermerhorn to continue what they were doing. Jesse reassured Shermerhorn that he knew the mysterious officer. Then, Jesse invited the officer to join them in bed. The three of them engaged in sexual activity, and after it was over, the officer got dressed. He warned Shermerhorn that no one should know about what had happened. Just as quickly as he had appeared, the officer left. The detectives and other police officers were understandably alarmed by Shermerhorn's story. There was a real possibility that the person responsible for Jesse's murder could be one of their own. It turned out that Jesse had spoken to his mother, Linda, about his relationship with a police officer, but he never disclosed the officer's name to her. In fact, Jesse might not even have known his real name. Linda recalled Jesse describing the officer as stalking him, but admitted that Jesse didn't know much about him. Jesse had expressed to Linda his growing suspicion about the man, as he realized he knew virtually nothing about his identity. Andy Shermerhorn was asked to come to the Columbia Police Station to assist in identifying the officer who had been at Jesse's apartment that night. Surprisingly, the identification process was straightforward for Shermerhorn. As he walked down a corridor at the station, another officer passed by. Shermerhorn was shocked. When he reached the room where he was supposed to review photographs from the Columbia Police Yearbook, he informed the detective, escorting him, that the man who had just passed them in the hallway was the same man he and Jesse had been in bed with that night. Stephen Rios, a 27-year-old officer, had been serving in the Columbia Police Department for three years. He was married with a newborn at home. His colleagues described him as a well-liked and respected member of the force. His superiors believed in his capabilities and were confident about his promising career trajectory. Rios was known for his ambition and strict adherence to rules. His fellow Columbia police officers were shocked to learn about his connection to Jesse and were reluctant to believe that he could have played any role in the murder. Jesse and Rios first encountered each other about two months prior to the murder at a party Jesse was attending. The police were called to break up the party, and Jesse, known for being argumentative, was arrested by Rios. He received a municipal court summons for obstructing government operations when he inquired about the reason for the arrest. This incident marked the beginning of an unusual relationship between the student and the police officer. Rios drove Jesse to the station, engaging him in personal conversations along the way. The day after the party, Rios showed up uninvited at Jesse's apartment, claiming he had more questions. However, his true intent was to seek sexual relations. Over the following months, Rios continued to visit Jesse unexpectedly, and they engaged in sexual encounters. Jesse's friend Joan Sheridan mentioned that Jesse was concerned about the charges from the party night not being dropped given his relationship with Rios. Jesse reportedly told Sheridan the next time the cop visits, I'll tell him I have a little secret the police chief might want to know about. Following Shermerhorn's revelations, Rios was brought in for questioning. At first, he denied having any sexual relations with Jesse, but when confronted with the eyewitness testimony of Shermerhorn, he admitted to their sexual encounters. Regarding the murder, Rios firmly denied any involvement, telling detectives that he was at home in bed with his wife on the night in question. He agreed to provide a DNA sample which was then compared with the DNA found under Jesse's fingernails. The sample matched, identifying Rios as the previously unknown third person. However, this discovery did not confirm Rios' involvement in the murder. The relationship between Rios and Jesse was also not illegal. After being questioned by detectives, Rios was released. During a re-examination of Jesse's body, the medical examiner noticed distinctive bruises on his chest and between his shoulder blades. These bruises indicated that Jesse had been immobilized using a choking technique known as one-sided vascular neck restraint, which is intended to cause loss of consciousness in the restrained individual within seconds. 
a law enforcement training officer, reviewed the bruises on Jesse and concurred that they could be the result of such a restraint. However, it was also possible that the technique was not applied correctly, and Jesse struggled against whoever was trying to restrain him, leading to additional bruising. The detectives reviewed Rios's police records and discovered that he had failed his defensive tactics training, adding another piece of evidence against him. In addition to the bruises on Jesse's chest, there were also several small, dark hairs that did not belong to Jesse. These turned out to be limb hairs, likely from the arm of the assailant who tried to strangle him. Some of these hairs still had roots, meaning they could be tested at DNA. The results came back as a match to Stephen Rios. Despite this, Rios continued to deny any involvement in Jesse's murder. However, it was revealed that he wasn't home for the entire night of Jesse's murder. He was unaccounted for 45 minutes, and no one could explain his whereabouts during that time. Charged with first-degree murder, Rios maintained his plea of not guilty. Special Prosecutor Morley Swingle, who had been handling the case from the start, told the jury that on the night of Jesse's death, Rios, as he often did, showed up unannounced at Jesse's apartment. Jesse's mother, Linda, revealed that Jesse found out about Rios being married with a child. Jesse had been apprehensive about the relationship from the beginning, but this discovery spurred his decision to end the affair. Swingle argued that Jesse threatened to inform Rios's superiors about their relationship if Rios didn't leave him alone. This infuriated Rios, who did not want the affair to end, and certainly did not want his family and co-workers to find out. Rios quickly became aggressive towards Jesse, causing Jesse to flee outside in an attempt to escape. However, Rios pursued him, catching him from behind and applying a chokehold. The two struggled, but Jesse eventually lost consciousness. An enraged Rios then slit Jesse's throat and fled. Valerie Leftwich, Rios's attorney, attempted to discredit Jesse's character in defense of her client. She portrayed him as promiscuous and volatile, with a fluctuating personality, claiming he had multiple lovers who were more likely suspects than her client. There will be evidence that Jesse Valencia had sexual encounters with numerous men whom he picked up online or in a bar, including Stephen Rios, she stated. The jury, however, was not swayed by Leftwich's weak arguments and sided with the forensic evidence. In May 2005, the jury in Rios's trial found him guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Rios's initial conviction was overturned by the Missouri Court of Appeals for the Western District due to hearsay deemed inadmissible by the court. A new trial took place in 2008, where he was found guilty of second-degree murder and armed criminal action. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, plus an additional 23 years. During the trial, Swingle pointed out that Rios used his badge for sex and then used a knife to forever silence his secret lover. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the tragic case of Jesse Valencia. Your viewership and engagement mean the world to us. If you found this story compelling, please subscribe and like. Your support helps us bring more stories to light. We also invite you to share your thoughts about this case in the comments. What stood out to you? What did this story make you feel? Your insights are invaluable. And if there's a particular case or mystery you're passionate about and want us to explore, please let us know in the comments. Your suggestions could be our next video. Stay safe and peace.